Hi there! This is Caleb Jones, and this is the Alpha Male 2.0 Podcast. And by the way, just so you know, I have another podcast called the Sovereign CEO Podcast. And that is on Five Flags, Moving Out of Your Country, Business, Location Dependent Business. If these are topics of interest to you, you can go to calebjones.com. That's C-A-L-E-B as in boy jones.com click podcast and you can subscribe to that podcast too and all the usual podcast platforms there's no reason that you shouldn't get all of my content because i do this podcast once a week i also do the sovereign ceo podcast once a week cool cool and by the way a small thank you to you guys the numbers behind this podcast the alpha male 2.0 podcast have really exploded lately not sure why not sure what happened it's not like i went on joe rogan or anything so uh thank you great and as always if you find this content helpful Spread the word. Uh, even if people don't agree with what I say, I'm still a pretty entertaining. And so if you have friends or people you might know who might like this kind of stuff, let them know. More the merrier for everybody. So um, here's something a little different. This, is a, this will be a different kind of podcast. I'm going to be a little more introspective, a little more emotional. <laughs> Not that I get emotional very often. So a while back, matter of fact, when I was last in Paraguay about a week ago during my trip, I had some downtime and I watched one of my all time favorite movies of all time. The very first Conan movie, the Conan, the Barbarian, 1981, I believe Arnold Schwarzenegger, the first of the two. And um, that's one of those movies that had a, a big effect on my childhood, even though when I watched it when I was a kid, I didn't understand most of it. A lot of it went over my head, and a lot of it was pretty sexy. And when you're a little kid, you don't want to see sexy stuff. When you're an adult, you're like, ooh. But when you're like, you know, eight, nine, ten years old, you see sexy stuff. You're like, ooh, girls, gross. Ew, what the fuck? What is this? Ugh. So uh, it's one of those movies I had to rewatch as an adult to really appreciate the symbolism of that movie. And what's really fascinating about that movie is that there's a lot of symbolism that went right over my head as not only as a kid, but as a teenager. When I rewatched as a teenager, I didn't get any of the symbolism. And for example, uh, this is not what I want to talk about the podcast, but I'm, I'm leading up to what I want to talk about. If you have seen the movie, uh, minor spoilers, but if you've seen the movie or even if you haven't seen the movie, the opening credits are someone forging a sword. Okay. That's the whole opening credits, forging the sword. It's actually Conan's father forging his sword and um, really fun. And then the very first scene of that movie, it's perfect. It shows Conan as a child and his father and with his sword. And they're sitting on top of a mountain. You see the, the mountains and the clouds, the background. It's really neat. Very striking scene. And his father is giving him a little talk about steel and how important steel is to their culture, how important it is to their religion. They worship a god named Krom. He's talking about steel and how, how critical it is and how it's important. And he's holding a sword. And he says to little Conan, he says, you cannot trust men, you cannot trust women, you cannot trust beasts. And then he points to the sword, he says, this you can trust. Cool. And then, again, minor spoilers, right after that, uh, Conan's village is attacked. His dad is killed by a bunch of raging uh, badasses. And his mom is decapitated right in front of him as a child by none other than James Earl Jones, the villain of the movie, Darth Vader. And he uses his father's sword to decapitate his mom. And he takes his father's sword. And so a lot of the movie is about Conan solving the riddle of steel. Because as part of his belief, when he dies, he will go before Krom, his god. And Krom will say, what is the what is the answer to the riddle of steel? And if he doesn't give an answer, he will laugh him out of Valhalla and he will go to hell or something like that. So all this is about steel. And there's a really neat scene about uh, maybe a third of the movie, one of my favorite scenes where he falls, Conan has escaped captivity. He falls into like this pit and it's actually a crypt and there's this old skeleton king and he finds a sword. It's an Aquilonian sword, or Atlantean sword. Let me think. Uh, no, it's an Atlantean sword, Atlantean sword. Finds the Atlantean sword and that becomes his sword of the movie. And I have that sword. That sword is right over there on my sword display that you see when I do Sovereign CEO videos. If you watch those videos, uh, the sword is the uh, second sword on the right. Camera right. Let's see, is that right? Camera right. Cam yes, camera right. The second sword, you see the, the one with the thickest handle. That's Conan's sword. Then later in the movie, he finds or he encounters the villain who killed his family, killed his village. And he's on the ground, bloody. And, and the villain, James Earl Jones, is explained to him in his Darth Vader voice. 
He's like, no, steel is useless. Uh, when I was young, I was into steel too, but that's when I was young and stupid and didn't know the world. Uh, steel, steel is useless. You know what? You don't know what's power. What is more important than steel is flesh. It's all about flesh. And he was a big guy into flesh because the guy would like turn into a snake and he'd have orgies, right? His people would have orgies and they would be cannibals and eat each other. And so he was really into the flesh, right? And there's a scene where all of his brainwashed priests are around him up on the walls. And he looks up at a cute young girl and he says, come child, come. And the girl says, yes, master. And she steps off the cliff and falls 37 feet and crashes in the ground and dies. And then he points at her, talking to Kona. He says, that is power. That is power. He says, what is steel compared to the hand that wields it? So he's getting a completed philosophy from his dad. His dad was about steel. This guy's about flesh. So it's a complete alternate philosophy. And again, this was lost on me when I was younger. Then at the end of the movie, so minor spoilers, sorry, he kills the bad guy. That shouldn't be a fucking spoiler. It's a Conan movie. Of course he fucking kills the bad guy. And, and it, again, if you really want to watch this movie and don't want to this spoiled, you are more than welcome to pause this podcast, go watch the movie and come back. It, I, it's a good movie. Um, it's not for everybody. It moves a little slow. It's more about visuals and symbolism. And there's a lot of good action scenes in it. A lot of good alpha male stuff in there. But anyway, at the end of the movie, as you may or may not know, he retrieves his dad's sword. Uh, he actually battles one of the bad guys who's using his dad's sword and he breaks his dad's sword. Breaks it in half as he battles the villain and he kills the villain, it's not the main villain. And he retrieves his dad's sword so it's broken. It's like half a sword, right? And what he does at the very end of the movie is he comes up behind the bad guy, the bad guy turns around, tries to hypnotize him, it doesn't work. And Conan decapitates James Earl Jones with the broken half of his father's sword. Bring it round full circle. And at the very end of the movie, he there's a scene where he holds up in each hand. In one hand, he has his broken father's sword. And the other hand, he has the head of his enemy, flesh. So it's flesh and steel. He holds them both up. And he has found the riddle of steel in that it's not about flesh or steel. It's about both. It's about the combination of both. That's what he figures out at the end of the movie. That's his revelation. And it shows him how he raises these two things up to the sky. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. I love, and I love it. And it's so sad. They can't make movies like this anymore. I've talked about that. I didn't find them in my content, my blogs especially. They just, they don't know how to make movies like this anymore. There is no symbolism in movies anymore. So movies just tell you. A woman can do everything a man can do. They, and the, a character is literally saying these words often almost to the camera. So they can't do symbolism anymore because part of cultural collapse is we don't have that ability anymore. But back, you know, in the good old days, 80s, early 90s, 70s, 60s, they had movies that had deep symbolism and had resonance and you could really think about it. And it's kind of sad that those days are gone and probably never coming back. But, at least we have those old movies. So I'm watching Conan, and um, there's a scene in the latest cut of that movie. Uh, it's not necessarily a director's cut, but it is a scene that the director, John Milius, very interesting guy, one of the few conservatives, right-wing conservatives in Hollywood historically. There's a scene where John Milius, the director, has put back into the movie. So when you saw it in the movie theater or you saw it on VHS back in the olden days, this scene was missing. He actually fought to put it back and, he's, and this scene is now back in the film. And it's a very brief little scene. It's just a little dialogue scene. It's only maybe 30 seconds. And it is the scene toward the end where Conan and his buddy, Subatai, the little Asian guy, uh, they're getting ready for the battle. There's like 30 guys coming to kill him and it's just Conan and Subatai and that's it. And they have to somehow fend off 30 guys. They're setting up the traps and the pit traps and the spikes and they're sharpening their swords. They're getting ready. Set up their arrows and all that crap, right? And they're talking about, they're having a moment where they're talking about when they were children and how it was springtime and how they enjoyed springtime and it really was wonderful and sweet. And, and, and Subutai talks about how he enjoyed it and Conan talks about how he enjoyed it. And at the end of the scene, Conan says, and I'm gonna, I may not get this quote exactly right, but he says this, he says, for men such as us, there is no spring. There is only the wind that smells fresh before the storm. And when he said that, it was one of those moments I had, I don't have these moments very often, but I had a moment where I paused the movie and I thought about it. And I really thought about it a lot and how it resonated with me. And a few things. Number one, being an alpha male is not necessarily about 
being strong or being loud. That is an aspect in some cases of the alpha male 1.0, but even you can be an alpha male 1.0 without being strong or loud. You can be physically weak and reasonably quiet and still be an alpha male. 1.0 or 2.0, usually a 1.0 because 2.0, I'm assuming you're lifting weights. But it's more about how the alpha male or the, the high value man, whatever you wanna call it, I call it alpha male, is always striving. He is always moving forward. He never arrives, which is a weird thought to have. It's a weird thought that I have, but it's true. When you stop striving, you begin to die. And I, I, this is a statistic I like to quote a lot. It's an, it's an old statistic, it's outdated, but it's true back when it was quoted. It's from the, uh, let's see, late 80s, early 90s. And that is that the average life expectancy back then of the tip of the average retired IBM executive, IBM was a big deal back then, big company, was four years. And so what would happen is these men would work and work and work and work and have meaning, okay? They'd retire and then they'd die because they had nothing to do. And that's what happens to men. Men need projects. Men need things to work on. Men need to improve. Women are a little different. Women follow a very different path than men in terms of that. So women don't necessarily need those things. Women are more into friends and family and things like that. Men need to move forward. And when you stop moving forward, you either die or if you're young, you become dysfunctional. You get depressed, you get fat, uh, you become addicted to porn. You have all these problems because you're not striving. You're not moving that direction. And when Conan said that, I thought about that and I said, yes, I'll never arrive. I will achieve big goals and I will accomplish things that are important to me. But when I'm done with that, I then have to accomplish the next goal. So one of my mentors, a guy I work with, he has said to me several times, Caleb, it's not about goals. Don't call them goals. Call them milestones. Because if it's a goal, you hit the goal and then what? You're kind of lost. That is why, and this is, I didn't know this guy back then, but that is why what I wrote in the Unchained Man, alphamalebook.com, my primary book. You have to focus on mission and then you have goals. You don't just have goals because what happens if you accomplish your goals? And if you know my story, uh, I achieved all my life goals by the time I was about 28 years old. And so from age 28 to about 33, I went into kind of this haze, this daze where I was just aimless because I didn't know what to do, but I'd accomplished all my goals. And I gained weight and I got divorced and it, I, I had a pretty shitty time in my late 20s, early 30s because I wasn't thinking ahead long term. I was just thinking in terms of goals and not milestones. And his point is you accomplish something and that's a milestone to the next thing. You never actually accomplish anything. You accomplish milestones as a step, as a stairway to heaven that goes forever. You'll never actually reach that. Okay, you'll never retire. You'll never be done. You don't wanna be done, okay? Being done is for betas. Being done is for pussies. Being done is for old men who are used up, okay? Not just old men, but old men who are used up. My mentors are all older men in their 70s who are not used up. These are men, the people I look up to are men in their 70s who are physically fit, kicking ass, working hard and loving life, but they're still striving. The men I feel sorry for are the men in their 60s, 70s, 80s who have given up and they sit around, they watch TV all day and they walk the dog and that's their life, not alpha. And so that is what Conan was referring to. The, the, the lifestyle of the warrior, and I don't like that term, but okay, the lifestyle of a warrior is there is no spring for us. There are these moments we can enjoy along the journey, but there is no spring. There is only that wind that smells fresh before the storm. And the storm is the work involved to get to the next milestone. And storm isn't a perfect metaphor because you may enjoy the storm. A lot of the work that I do in my business life, most of it is something I really enjoy. A lot of my work I would do for free. Not all of it, but a lot of it. I would do it for free because I like it, okay? I like my work. And so we call it work, but it's also enjoyable. So it's striving, but it's also enjoyable. There's some work I like, there's some work I don't, okay? Um, I am right in the middle right now of a very serious fitness regimen, something I've never done before, uh, where I'm lifting weights pretty hardcore, more hardcore than I've ever lifted before. And it's hard while I'm lifting the weights, I'll be honest with you. And there are days I don't wanna do it. But boy, do I feel good after. God damn, I feel great. I feel fucking amazing. Okay, and I always, I feel amazing anyway. I have high testosterone, I'm very healthy and blah, 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 blah. But the work is its own reward, even though you haven't hit that milestone yet. Okay, when you hit the milestone, you have another milestone. So when I lose all the weight that I want, all the body fat that I want, that is a milestone. I have, I have more fitness goals, physical goals after that. Okay, I wanna get back into martial arts. I wanna get my black belt because I was robbed of my black belt when I was a kid. Different story for another time. I've talked about it before in other podcasts. But that's my point. There's never a spring where you just sit around. 
You can take breaks, but there's never a spring. And I'll give you another example of this. I recently read in a book of a guy, written by a guy who is much more financially successful than me. And he basically said, and it bothered me when he said this, and it still bothers me a little bit, but he's right. He said, we look forward to the time where we're no longer in transition. Okay, we look forward to a time where we're settled. We have everything arrayed the exact way we want, and now we're good. Because that's how I feel. There are certain things I want in my life that I want arrayed by the time I am 54 years old. That's my that's my age objective for this. And so once I'm there, I'm settled, I'm good, then I can go to the next phase of my life. I'll still strive, but I'm settled, I'm good. And he said, that's bullshit. We are always in transition. You will never not be in transition. You will always be in transition from one state to another. Always, always, always. I don't care what you've accomplished. If you're a billionaire, you're in transition. Even if you have ripped six pack abs and your body is perfect, you're in transition on your body. You're going through another transition. You'll always be in transition. You should never look forward to a time when you're not in transition. That's BS, he said. And I went, oh, I don't like that. That doesn't sound good because I don't like being in transition. I just went through a, a month or two ago, a huge transition in my life, moving my wife and her dog over to Dubai with me, getting into a house in Dubai, buying all the furniture, setting up kind of all of our life infrastructure here in Dubai. It took several months and it, you know, it, it fucked up my business for a while. It was not pretty. So I was, I was going through that as I read this, like, oh, fuck this. I don't want to go through transition. But again, I reminded myself, yes, I'm always striving. I'll always be in transition. Most of transitions will not be painful, and that's true. I've been through many transitions in my life, and the vast majority of them were pleasurable, or at least neutral, and they always ended up to a better place. Only a few of them were painful. Matter of fact, I only think of one or maybe two or three in the past 25 years that were actually painful. Most of them were good. So who cares if I'm always in transition, that's okay. And that is the life I've chosen as a man who wants to be accomplished, who wants to be successful in life, who wants to be a cut above the typical man, who wants to be the alpha male, particularly the alpha male 2.0. That's the lifestyle I've chosen. I'm glad I've chosen that. And what's interesting is that when Conan said this line, he didn't say it sadly. He was like, oh, this sucks. We don't get a spring, that's lame. He didn't say it like a millennial would say it or a Gen Z guy would say it. He said it like, yeah, yeah, there is no spring for us. There is only the wind that smells fresh before the storm. He just And he says it like that, not a big deal, okay? Interesting, so that's the first quote I wanna give you from Conan that we can learn from Conan is you always have to be striving. Now I'm gonna give you another quote, okay? Second one. And this is from the same movie. This is just maybe a few minutes after the scene. There's another scene where they're, they're almost ready for the big battle. They put on their armor, they get their weapons ready, right? Him and, him and his buddy, and the wizard, the wizard comes down from his little hut, right? That little Asian wizard with the funny voice, okay? Um, what was his name? Uh, what was the wizard's name in Conan? Um, Akiro, played by Mako, which is a famous Japanese actor back in the day. And uh, so Akiro, the wizard comes down with that big funny red thing he wears, and he comes to the two warriors, he comes to Conan and his friend, he says, hey, I got good news for you guys, the gods, favor you they favor you and so they're gonna watch the battle they're gonna watch the whole thing pretty neat and conan says are they gonna help and the wizard goes no and he says it like that no you dumbass they're not gonna help that's exactly how it works and that's exactly how you should view life because this is how i view life the gods now i'm being metaphorical here i don't believe in gods and you probably don't either the gods, or God, if you want to be Christian or religious about this, or the universe, if you're an atheist, or the higher power, whatever, okay, whatever you believe in or don't believe in, the gods favor you. I'll call it the gods, okay? The gods do favor you. Uh, what I learned from one of my mentors, Brian Tracy, is that you act as if you are guaranteed to succeed. You act as if the universe is conspiring to help you. He would say that over and over again. Act as if the universe is conspiring to assist you. He goes, now, it's not gonna do it for you. You have to take action, but when you take action, the universe will assist you. Uh, Robert Ringer has another one of my mentors, has a really great book he wrote about, oh, 15 years ago called Action. And the whole book is about that. When you take action, all of a sudden the entire universe and God, if you believe in God, comes behind you and pushes you forward and assists you. If you don't take action, universe doesn't help, okay? And so that's P 
piece number one is that the gods favor you. I, this is my belief. My belief is the universe, God, whatever you want to call it, okay, favors me. It likes me and it wants me to succeed. And so when I move forward and I take action and while I'm striving, the universe is actually helping me and conspiring and working behind the scenes to make sure I succeed. Maybe it's easy if I succeed, maybe it's difficult, maybe I have to work hard, depends on the scenario, okay? But it wants me to succeed. It wants me to make the money I wanna make. It wants me to live this amazing alpha male 2.05 flags life that I live. It wants me to lose the weight that I'm trying to lose. It wants me to do these things, provided I continue to take action, okay? It's a fantastic belief to have. Whether or not you think it's bullshit, the belief can only help you. Look, you can believe that the universe is conspiring to help you, or you can believe the universe hates you and is going out of, it, out of its way to make your life miserable. Now, the elites are certainly in that category. If you live in the Western world, they are conspiring to make your life miserable. That's, that's, they want you to live a, at a certain level. They don't want you to be too smart or too wealthy. They want you to have some money, but not too much. They want you to be educated, as George Carlin has said, just enough to operate the machinery and manage the paperwork, but that's it, but that's it. So that's certainly a category. That's certainly true. But we're not talking here about the elites or you know the people who run your country or the people who run corporate America or what have you. We're talking about the universe, okay? So that's the first piece. Second piece is when he says, will they help? And the wizard says, no, precisely. No one's going to help you. You're on your own. I will give you a perfect example of this from my personal life. As many of you know, Pink Firefly and I regularly see a marriage therapist. And I and I mandated that as soon as she moved in with me, you know, almost five years ago. And she was, why do we have to see a marriage therapist where everything's fine? Right, I wanna keep things fine. I wanna make sure that we maintain this good marriage forever as long, as long as we can by having that third party to work with and to make sure we're working on the relationship and to make sure that we have a neutral third party in case there's a disagreement and blah, 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 okay. Very valuable thing. I recommend this for men who live full-time with a woman or are married. Hopefully an OLTR marriage where it's non-monogamous and you can hook up other women whenever you want, like I can. But anyway, we were in this session and I forget what we were talking about. I forget the topic where this came up. But I, I, I explained to both the therapist and Pink Firefly. I said, I turned to Pink Firefly. I said, now look, let me explain something to you. You have me to rely on. You do, you have me. If you have a problem in your financial life, you have me, you're married to me. You're married to this financially successful, powerful man. You have me. If you need to you know, help trying to fix the dishwasher, you got me. You can rely on me to help you do that, okay? If you've had a bad day, you, know, you can rely on me to listen to you and help you through your problem. If you have an issue in your career, you, you can rely on me to help you because I love you and I'm your husband and I'm here to support you. I said, however, I'm on my own. I don't have anyone to rely on. And she's like, well, what do you mean? Of course you rely I said, well, no. If I have a problem in one of my companies, can you help me with that? No, okay? If uh, I'm in my, my kitchen, I have my own kitchen, we have separate kitchens. If I'm in my kitchen and my refrigerator stops working, can you help me repair the refrigerator? No. If I've got a computer problem on my computer, can you help me fix the computer problem? Nope. Okay, so in terms of, life, if there's a big financial problem, we can't pay our bills, can you help me with that? Can you whip up $20,000? No. So in terms of logistical life, in terms of someone to rely upon in my life, sweetheart, I'm still talking to her, you can rely on me, but I have no one to rely on. I love you and you're my companion and you're my, my soulmate and all that horseshit, but I, I have no one to rely upon. I'm on my own. And I quickly added, I like it that way. I've chosen that. I don't want to rely on other people. There have been times in my life when I was a younger man where I had to rely on other people and I hated it. I don't know if you can relate to this, but when you rely on other people, usually they fuck up and then you're in deep, 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 deep shit. I don't like relying on other human beings because human beings are flawed and they fuck up. I'd rather rely on me. I talk about the Unchained Man, how you have external security and internal security. Okay, I like relying on me and the systems I've created in my life. My five flag systems in my international life, my multiple companies and multiple income streams in my business life, my multiple women in my sex life. I like to rely on the systems that I've built. I don't wanna rely on any one person. So I said, I'm not complaining. I'm not saying that's bad. I've chosen this. I could have married some very masculine badass woman who is really good at business and you know, really good at fixing shit around the house and really good with computers and 
You know, I could have married Layla Hermosi. I could have done that. I didn't want to. I'm not attracted to that kind of woman. So I married a little sweetheart, a little princess who I can take care of. That's what I chose to do. So it's okay. But that goes back to my point. No one is there to help you. One of the greatest essays ever written by one of my, another one of my mentors, a lot of mentors today, Harry Brown, the guy who wrote How I Found Freedom in an Unfree World, which was the spiritual precursor to the Unchained Man. One of the best essays he ever wrote was a letter he wrote to his daughter. And the entire point of the letter is, no one owes you anything. If you want something, you gotta go out and provide value and get it. No one owes you shit. Exactly. No one is gonna help you. And unfortunately, we have an entire two generations now in the Western world, millennials and Gen Zs, who are sitting around with their hands out saying, well, I don't wanna do that. I want someone to do that for me. Again, Western collapse. This is gonna get worse and worse and worse and worse. I don't care how old you are. You have to understand that no one is there to help you. Your mom's not gonna help you. Your daddy's not gonna help you. Your boss at work's not gonna help you. Donald Trump's not gonna help you. Bernie Sanders is not gonna help you or your non-American equivalent of your politicians. Politicians aren't gonna help you. Your country's not gonna help you. The police aren't gonna help you. No one's gonna help you. You're on your own. The universe will assist because the universe favors you, that's true, but no one's gonna help you. You have to do it yourself. Now that doesn't mean you hire people in your businesses to outsource, of course you do that. But to generate that work, you have to do that yourself. No one will do this for you, okay? And if you are looking out to the world for people to help you, guaranteed you're gonna be disappointed and frustrated. Guaranteed you're in for a fall. This is a horrible, horrible attitude to have, to look out in the world and hope that people will help you. Because I stopped doing that a long time ago and boy was I a lot happier when I made that decision. When I made that transition from, I want people to help me because I'm a nice person to no one's gonna help me, I have to do this myself. My happiness went up, not down. It sounds like, well, that's a horrible, horrible, lonely life to live. No, I'm not lonely. Are you kidding? I'm around people all the fucking time, women in particular. No, you'll be happier. I'll give you another example from another movie, okay? Another one of my favorite movies. This is one of my favorite movies from the past 10, 15, 20 years, okay? Which is not difficult because they don't know how to make good movies anymore. The movie The Gray, starring Liam Neeson, okay? Where he he's in a group of uh, people who crash land on an airplane in the Alaskan wilderness. And there's a scene in that movie, perfect scene. It's perfect. He's alone, okay, he's by himself, his friends are missing or all dead, and he's bleeding and bloody and tired and starving, wounded. He's sitting by a creek and there's beautiful trees, it's snow everywhere, and he's looking up in the sky and he says, he talks to God, he says, I'm not gonna quote this exactly, but basically he says, look, give me a sign that you're real and I will believe in you. Get Do something right now, I'm asking you, I'm telling you, do something. Show me that you're real to justify all this pain and suffering. Show me that you're real right now and I will devote my life to you. I will worship you. I will believe in you. Everything. But you've got to, after all this pain and suffering I've been through that was no one's fault, you've got to show me that you're real. Show me that you're real. Just show me now. Do something. Do it. Now. Show me. And he looks up and he waits. He looks up in the sky and he looks out in the forest and... Nothing happens. There's this moment of silence. He just looks. Nothing happens. And he has this look on his face. He's thinking about it. And then he says, fuck it, I'll do it myself. Perfect scene. Perfect. That's exactly how life works. Fuck it, I'll do it myself. If I gotta do it myself, I'll do it myself. I'll do it myself. Now, side point, if something had happened if there had been a sign like a tree fell over or a fish jumped out and said hi or whatever the fuck, I don't know. If something had happened when he's looking for a sign, I, it would have ruined the movie for me. I would have went, oh my God, fuck this movie. They, they, they ruined it. And there are some movies who have certain scenes where they're perfect except for one thing at the end where it ruins the scene. I gave you several examples, but I don't wanna get off track. But it was perfect, that didn't happen. He said, fuck it, I'll do it myself. That's how it works. You do it yourself. Again, that doesn't mean you can't hire people to help you. That's, I'm not saying that, you get what I'm saying. To implement the results you want in your life, you have to do it yourself, no one's gonna help you. And you have to keep doing this for the rest of your life. You keep striving for the rest of your life. The happiest, most healthy, physically healthy men I know who are over the age of 70 are in that category, all of them. 
They are still striving. They are still working. Now, they may not work long hours like I do. They may work less hours the week. They take a lot of time off. They work when they want, but they work and they focus and they strive. They work on their bodies. They work on their businesses. They work on their marriages if they're married. They work on these things to improve as men and they don't stop. There is no spring. There is only the wind that smells fresh before the storm. And that's it. Boy, this is a longer podcast than I usually do. I kind of got, got in a tear, didn't I? I could use many other examples from movies I've, I have watched or books that I have read because I've read all the Robert E. Howard Conan short stories and he did one novel, which I've, I've read that too. So I've read all the Conan stuff. Conan's a big, big part of my life. Matter of fact, at some point very soon, I'm gonna order a Conan print I'm gonna put on my wall for when I do webinars because I realize when I do webinars, there's nothing cool behind me. So I'll have to do that. But anyway, enough on that. I will see you in the next podcast. I hope this has helped. Have fun, bye.